gonna pass over the floor to David. Over to you, David. Thanks, Terry, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, whatever it might be, wherever you are. And I think a special uh, welcome to Mr. Jim Hall, who's in North Carolina, and uh, Mr. Damien Hocking, who's in Calgary in Canada. And we have Rodney Bertrand, who I believe is joining us. Uh, is it from Brassard in Louisiana, or it could be Houston? I'm not too sure. But um, welcome, guys. You guys are up very, very late. So if I can get this working, <laughs> we'll see what happens. Here we go. So what we're going to do um, in this process, we'll try and answer all the questions. We've got a few questions that are popping up, uh, I see, but I, being an old man, I can't uh, chew gum and think at the same time. So I won't be able to answer your questions while, while I'm talking. But... Um, Let's all take a sightseeing tour of a very small part of a complex and critical process. Terry and I are only going to touch on a smidgen of what you should be learning in a gas lift course. And what you're going to be doing is over a period of, um, if you're in a gas lift course, a four or five day course, you're going to be getting just a touch of sometimes 50, 60, 70 years experience of the people who are teaching. So it may be new. It may be a refresher, but will it will never be unnecessary, no matter what level you think you may be. So I'll be your tour guide for this part, looking at surveillance tools, practices, processes, operations, and some troubleshooting. First, we'll go through a couple of questions. Would you be able to do a rough hand drawing of your gas lift system from the reservoir to custody transfer with approximate pressures and flows? If you're in the group, would you be able to do that on a piece on a whiteboard? Do you know the specific gravity of your gas lift gas? When it was last sampled and where that sample was taken? How important is temperature in the opening and closing of your gas lift valves downhole and in the workshop? What sort of meters do you have installed for your gas lift? Do you have two or three phase separators? Is there a pressure difference between your I, your production pressure and your test separator? When was the last time you visited the field and spent time with your operators? When was the last time your operation staff received gas lift skills training? What temperature setting is used in the gas lift lab? What is IPO and what is PPO? Terry sort of gave you a bit of a hint on that. During the unloading of your well, are all the valves open as gas is injected? I think Terry answered that question for you as well. Do you know what a limit diagram does? All little things that as you go through the process that is gas lift, that you will be learning on your journey. Something else to remember on your journey is that you may not always be in gas lift, so you may think it's unnecessary. But remember, your wells will always be on gas lift or artificial lift while you move up through the ranks or to the corner office. Any training you undertake should not be cookie cutter death by PowerPoint exercise. It should be inclusive to all skill levels. It should address everything from the reservoir to the point of custody transfer. And you may believe that a module isn't for you. Oh, I'm only interested in modeling and I don't need all of this stuff, but I think you may be wrong. Your instructors are taking the time to draw on their many decades of practical knowledge to impart skills to you to make you a better person in your role. So gas lift can be seen as having five skill levels. They are awareness, that's the first level, gaining a good understanding of the subject and having the ability to ask relevant questions. We then move on to knowledge, an active application and participation, but someone who requires a little help or advice. Once you get to the skill level, it's a person who can perform tasks to a high standard, doesn't require help and can teach others. At mastery, 
It's a very high skill level with extremely broad experience, ability to coach others to skill level and recognized at company and global industry level. And then we get to expert. They're recognized as a principal technical expert within the organization. They are sought after as a distinguished lecturer, an ability to advise and liaise at the highest corporate and government levels. Now, these levels apply in gas lift, but they also apply in all the other skills in petroleum engineering or reservoir engineering or whatever. They're, they're easily transferable. Getting to surveillance, I like to look at surveillance as not just a circle, but I see it as an infinity loop with four points. It's monitor, analyze, improve, integrate, and go back to monitor. Gas lift surveillance in a nutshell, that's what it is. Monitor, analyze, improve, integrate. Monitor the wells, fix the wells, optimize the wells, optimize the system. How? Analyze wells individually. Predict impacts of changes to wells operation. Make necessary mechanical changes to the wells. It's thinking. Optimize input gas to wells individually. The resources to be used are accurate and complete representative well data. We'll explain that a little bit later. Surface pressure recorder charts, SCADA, which are now known as uh, your Pi or your dashboard on your desktop. Accurate and representative well tests. Know what a representative well test is or in Jim's case, know what a repeatable well test is. We'll talk about that later in the session. Subsurface pressure and temperature surveys, flowing gradient surveys, static gradient surveys, well tracer surveys. Software, well flow, pipe sim, prosper, wing glue, well tracer. You can see we're getting to the point where it's not just about doing designs and a properly skilled surveillance person. So the cornerstones of effective surveillance, troubleshooting and optimization are well tests, surveys, flowing static and tracer. The cornerstones of effective reservoir management are well tests, surveys, flowing, static and tracer. Can you see where this is going? Reservoir, yes. vertical, and surface models should generally be measured data, be based on measured data to generate confidence simulations for performance, decline analysis, decline analysis, reserves calculations, back allocation, hydrocarbon accounting, mass balance. So these are things that a lot of times we miss out the importance of having purely on gathered or measured data. Now we get down to the two most significant actions in the gas lift surveillance process are, guess what they are? Well tests, surveys, flowing, static and tracer. Where have we heard that before? As an industry, we typically do not apply enough attention to this information source to harvest its true benefit. This is because we have misguided business drivers. We live on a 90 day plan myopia. We have a misguided perception of value. Poor time management, one of the biggest impacts. The ability to conduct such information gathering and that lends itself to equipment and skills. And in most cases, budget. Operations are the key in this process and they are your eyes, ears and hands in the gathering of this significant information. Measurements such as pressures, volumes and temperatures in the reservoir, fluid properties, etc., are only able to be gathered when the well is drilled, a surveillance campaign is conducted, an analog well is drilled or surveyed in the field. 
well models can only be calibrated against measured data. Regular measured data comes from daily readings, tubing head pressure, gas lift gas flow, flow line pressure, tubing head temperature, compressor readings. Weekly, monthly, well test data, gas lift gas in, total gas out, water out, total gas liquid ratio, all of those things. So let's get to some diagnostic tools. Diagnostic tools you will need to learn about is wireline tagging, fluid in tubing, acoustic fluid levels in casing annulus, tracer surveys, the new thing, the new kit on the block, well, it's been around for a while, but it's now becoming more acceptable, is well tracer, scan well. Well test, perform properly. That is a big question. Well tests performed properly. Injection gas measurement, in and out. Pressure transmitter, casing tubing, riding to online plots or dashboard SCADA. Pressure transmitter, temperature surveys performed properly, flowing gradient surveys. Calculations, valve calculations, deepest point of injection analysis, vertical lift profile analysis. Remembering vertical lift profiles are fed into your surface modeling, uh, which Terry didn't get a chance to, uh, to talk about, but it's another thing that you would learn in a good um, training course. Performance verve curve evaluation, stability criteria, all of these things. Operations have a critical role to play in well testing and flowing gradient survey data capture. We have a little saying here that um, if someone was to hold up, I don't know whether you can see this, you can see this? This is, oh, there we are. That's a pen, isn't it? but it's also the world's smallest test separator. If an operator wants to give you some numbers and you're not out there to see what he's doing, he can generate a well test from a pen and you're not going to know what he's done. But anyway, that's another story and it's a story you'll hear in a lot of training courses. Well test data is normally classified as valid or invalid. Gas lift people have a third category, representative. It has to be representative of the current performance of the well. Think about it. If a well is underperforming, we need the invalid data to be able to troubleshoot the well and find out what's wrong with it. Should you only look at the latest well test data? You all know the answer. You need to look at several recent tests to understand how the well is performing and if anything has changed over time, just not a single snapshot. The next thing you should have in your armory or learn to build or learn to understand is um, what we call a surveillance process map, a roadmap to doing your surveillance. And I'll present here a very quickly a generic one, which will go through the four phases we said before. It'll go through on the top line, the things you need to do. Below that in the blue, you'll have how you obtain the data to perform the top line. And then underneath, you would have who are the people involved in that process. So monitoring well performance, we have well site visits, operations contacts, SCADA, well test data, field records. And the people who do that are the operators, the well analysts, the field engineer, and the surveillance engineer. So as you go through the monitor stage, we see if there is a problem. If you have a problem that's solved and everything is done, you document the solution, you go back to monitoring the well. If the answer is no, we then move to the next stage, which is analyze. Again, we have the various steps we go through. Collate and validate input data, true vertical model to to data, evaluate calibrated performance. We have the various information sources we use to do that. And then we have the people who are involved. If we get to a point in analyze, if further action is required and it's no, we go back to the beginning and the well just sits there and we don't worry about it until it causes a problem again. It's a bit like some of your children, if you have children, you only take notice of the ones who are causing trouble. 
let the others play comfortably on their own. If it's yes, we then move on to the improve, just like with your children. You improve their attitude, the, you improve their behaviour. So is action injection change only? If it's yes, you go down, you change that, and guess what? Everything's okay. Or you have to go through, you have to redesign, you have to prepare and submit programs, you have to get the program approved, and then you implement it, each with what are the actions and who are the people. Finally, we get to integrate. And this is the final stage where we distribute new parameters. We obtain the well test to confirm the predicted uplift. Everything is wonderful. We update the records. We document everything, document everything, and we return to monitor the well. So gas lift, best practices, hints, and tips. So here we have a document that was developed and you'll see down the bottom, it says by Mr. Jim Hall, who is listening in from North Carolina, principal technical expert, gas lift and well, gas well deliquefaction at Shell International for many years. And Jim uh, got together um, to make up this uh, little list and it's about a tally book size. It can fit in your back pocket. So it's a nice little card that we gave out and um, then another colleague of ours, uh, we got together and we got it uh, also made up into Bahasa, Malaysia. So we also have it in a second language. But it just gives rules of thumb and ideas of what to do when you're a gas lift person. So increase production, decrease gas lift rates, reduce back pressure, increase lift depth. Uh, here we're going on to PPO valves, increase injection pressure to lift deeper. Do not control with well head back pressure on PPO valves. Injection pressure operated valves, decrease injection pressure, must have injection rate control. So you must have control on surface for IPO valves. To eliminate heading or slugging, you do not need to be aggressive with unloading designs. And oversized orifices, which a lot of people think I'll just put a big orifice at the bottom and then I'll cold control everything on surface. It doesn't work, but you'll have to learn all about that. Hopefully not the hard way. We go through things about working smarter, well testing, downhole surveys, pressure and temperature surveys. You'll all get um, be able to see uh, this in um, afterwards when you have access to the uh, final presentation. Surface pressure monitoring and recording. Record keeping, provide operators. Now this is an important point. If you're onshore and your operators are offshore operating the, operating the wells, provide the operators with valve depths and operating pressures, provide them with the target liquid production rate and retain surface pressure charts as reference to where troubleshooting. So they have to know what's happening. And here's quite a handy little chart pulled together by Jim. And it gives you total gas to liquid ratio guidelines that tell you when you what TGLR you may have and whether it's a problem, whether you need to cut gas, if it's inefficient, whether it's maximum production efficient or increased gas. Now, these are rules of thumb. They are not exact numbers. Guidelines. So let's move on to well testing and surveys. Very quickly, we'll go through this. Well tests allow trending over time of significant parameters. Most software um, packages provided now uh, by the various companies have a well test entry panel, which usually uh, allow entry of six or seven different parameters. These allow you to generate a depth versus pressure plot, which gives you the current performance of the well from that well test in relation to the gas lift valve opening and closing points, the uh, injection pressure of the gas lift. And you can see here, we have an orifice down here at uh, 2000, but we only have a delta or a differential between the casing and the tubing at the gas lift valve in number four. So that will be the point of injection. You'll also see the slope change there. These are all the things you're going to have to learn or get to know or refresh yourself in gas lift. 
So if we run a flowing gradient survey, we have another panel to enter that sort of thing. It gives us an output and the output is then overlaid with the production pressure plot from the well test. And you can see the green line here is the flowing gradient survey. And then we have the well test, they don't match. So what we have to do is we have to calibrate against measured data. The flowing gradient survey is measured. The production pressure curve is calculated using measured well test data. So we must calibrate to the production pressure, calibrate the production pressure model to the flowing gradient survey. We don't go in and we don't willy nilly change um, our um, correlations or um, numbers all over the place. We focus on a small number of things that will make us fit the curve in the least number of steps. The first thing we have to do is match the curve below the point of injection. And you can see here we've done some changes. We've got lift gas rate, formation gas and water cut have been changed and we've got a pretty good match of what the well is doing in real time. What we'll do is um, in any good training session, we'll go through a whole suite of troubleshooting. We'll show you uh, possible causes, possible results, possible correlations, corrections to those things. Things like injection choke too small, high injection pressure, low gas volume, high separator operating pressure, well heading or slugging. The well won't unload. Oh, that's another big problem. You always be sitting in the office and they bring a well online and the first phone call you get is, we can't unload the well. So there goes your next day or two or three or four while you sort out the problems. I'll make a point at this time is that if you're the gas lift person, or you're the artificial lift person in an organization. If anything goes wrong in a well and it's got gas lift in it, it's a gas lift problem. It's always a gas lift problem. So you have to go and solve the problem. 999 times out of 1000 incidents, it's not a gas lift problem, but you have to solve it for the REs and all of the other people in because they don't know how to. So that's why a gas lift person has to be so versatile. So other ways of looking at your well, DTS, distributed temperature sensor, using optical fiber, which can be installed in well, in the well during the completion stage. Um, now they're actually running um, distributed temperature which actually dissolves after a certain amount of time. You run it into the well while the well's flowing and um, it will dissolve over time, but you'll get back the readings before it's gone. Here's a plot of the various mandrels and the temperature changes in those from a DTS. The next thing is gas lift CO2 tracer surveys. So well tracer or, um, or some of the other brands. And the idea of this is you fire a shot of CO2 in with the gas lift gas. Um, the software in the surface equipment sets a timing for the travel time down and back. And you should get a spike back of CO2 above the background CO2, which you've recorded, which tells you where all the gas is entering. You can see from this one, all of the gas is going in at the orifice. Here's an example from 2012 with Conco Phillips presented at an SPE seminar in Bergen. And you can see on the left here, we have a spike at the first mandrel. We have a little kick at the second, and we have another large spike at the orifice where all the gas is coming through. So we have multi-pointing in this well. Now, normally you would say, oh, we have to go and change the valves. But in this case, by running the CO2 tracer, which required no well intervention, they didn't have to shut in the well, they didn't have a wireline crew or anything, they were able to reduce the casing head pressure to close the upper valve because every 
uh, valve that is an IPO valve has a surface gauge or a downhole opening and closing. And as long as you are below the closing pressure, that valve will close. All they did was reduce the casing head pressure to close the upper valves and they ended up lifting from the bottom. So that's the end. That was a small snapshot of some of the content of a focus training event. Thank you for your attention and we'll be addressing questions later in the forum.